thank you for the kind introduction. I, um, 11. Yeah, see, I can't tell stories very well, so I, I hope this goes over well. Um, on the way out here, I, I discovered that I had a little bit extra time this morning, so um, uh, I hope I can, I can go through the notes that I have and the overheads that I've brought along and, and try to make this all clear, but I thought with a little extra time I would throw in uh, a story here and there, and, and I actually have an, uh, an impersonation. I have a wise use impersonation that I'm going to do. This is how it goes. You know, I find these things dang uncomfortable. Do you mind if I take this off and just, you know, relax a little bit? Anybody know who that was? Huh? Sorry. I got to work on it. It was Jim Catron. Jim Catron is um, the, uh, the lawyer for Catron County, New Mexico. He's also one of the chief uh, legal minds of the so-called county supremacy movement. And uh, along with Karen Bud Phelan, who Tarso mentioned last night, um, and he also has quite a roadshow, or in the heyday of the county supremacy movement, at least, he did have quite a roadshow, selling uh, ordinances, model ordinances and, and uh, resolutions to counties around the West. And uh, uh, before these ordinances were struck down in several courts, he really had quite a business going. He's quite a showman. Um, and I think that's evidenced by the fact that they, they were as, as popular and successful at selling these ordinances in the West as they, as they had been. Uh, he one time, kind of as an aside, was at a, a meeting of lawyers somewhere, uh, Western uh, public lands lawyers, I think, and somebody asked him about these ordinances, and they said, you know, you know that these things are going to fail if they're ever challenged in the courts, right? And he, off the record, um, as I uh, have heard, said, well, yeah, that's probably true, but you know, they sure are getting a lot of attention, aren't they? <laughs> now, you can look at that two ways. Cynically, you can say, you know, that bugger, he's selling people at a high cost uh, these documents that are bogus, that won't do anything for the county, that give people false hope about actually gaining political power in this process, and he knows that when the court comes down and decides what the, the validity of these things is, they're going to be overturned. Um, and I, you know, that's the cynical view. On the other hand, with a grudging amount of respect, you have to say, well, you know, the guy is building a base. He may not be sent doing it truthfully, uh, but he's out there, he's got a product, he's got a message, um, he's doing organizing, isn't he? And to a certain extent, that's true. Um, that was my Jim Catron. Um, I'll work on that. I, I don't have any other impersonations, so you don't have to worry about that. Um, I am actually very, very happy to be here. I've never been to Montana. Um, it's been wonderful so far. It's great to have so many people show up. And I think the topic matter here is really vital. Um, I'm glad to be a part of being able to present uh, a portion of what I can uh, provide in terms of information about the convergence. Um, uh, of the, the wise use movement and the broader right. Um, a year ago, I was in Reno, Nevada. Tarso last night mentioned that um, the, uh, the folks with uh, Ron Arnold's wise use leadership conference are all meeting to plot the next year. This is the 10th annual meeting. Uh, I was there last year, it was quite an experience. I, um, I got there, went to the, the, the initial happy hour on Friday night and uh, walked in. The first thing I did, I mean, I'm stick, sticking out like a sore thumb, right? So I walked up to Chuck Cushman and said, Chuck, hi, I'm Dan, and he was like, hey, you know, and he introduced me to a bunch of folks. Most people were very cordial. A few people ignored me. Um, later on, I, I had one beer up there, and, and Chuck all of a sudden started saying, hey, I want to go down and watch the, the Trailblazers play. This is a, an enormous casino with a, a sports bar with a screen the you know, size of this wall. And uh, he took off, and I was even more stranded. So I decided, well, why not? And I went downstairs, and I found Chuck sitting in front of this enormous TV. And uh, he was sitting there with a plate of food. He had two enormous turkey sandwiches. They were bigger than his head. They were the biggest sandwiches I've ever seen in my life. And I sat down, I said, you know, he was sitting alone. I said, do you mind if I, you know, sit down and join you? He said, no, fine, go ahead. Yeah, I'm just watching the game. And I sat there for a second and I was, I, I really needed another adult libation. So I said, I'm gonna go get a beer. Can I get you one while I'm up? He says, no, you know, I've got really, I've got heart problems. I gotta be really careful about, you know, how I treat myself, so. Um, but he managed to get those, those sandwiches down. He's a healthy guy. I don't know if anybody here has ever worked with Chuck, Chuck Cushman. The guy is passionate, um, he's robust, and he's a pain in the butt. He's, uh, he's been doing this work for 20 years now. He was a wise use activist before wise use had a name. Um, anyway, that's the end of the stories. Um, the, the, the information I'm gonna pre present here, and I have a high-tech slideshow or overhead show here that I hope will, will um, provide some of this stuff. I think is really scratching the surface of this topic. Um, the topic, as it was presented, the, the, the title before I got here of this, um, this talk was um, Wise Youth and the Connections to Right-Wing Wackos. I don't particularly favor the term wackos. I mean, I think it's a pejorative term. I think it simplifies 
our opposition, and I think that is a dangerous thing to do uh, because we have a very savvy, politically complicated opposition. Um, and I think that's the weakness and the issue that we're here to deal with today, is understanding how this, this opposition that we face, whether it is the anti-environmental movement um, itself or as a part of the broader right on both extremes, the, the extreme radical uh, uh, Christian right, um, as they've been described, or the extreme radical free market uh, think tanks on the other end, the more mainstream and acceptable right. Um, I think understanding the, the structure of this network and, and how it was put together and how its structure serves the, uh, the, its goals is important for not only environmental activists, but also other folks in this room, um, uh, folks who are concerned with education or labor issues, uh, human dignity issues. You know, these are, these are attacks that we're all suffering, um, and we're, we're, we're suffering them a, a little bit right now, I think, in a piecemeal fashion. And I think your remarks were right on. We do need to work uh, a lot more together to, to be able to, uh, to address these issues. Um, now, that's not to say that there aren't some wackos in the movement, um, but I, I think it's, uh, it's not fair to call them all wackos. Um, and I'm also uncomfortable calling the convergence, the simple term that I use to describe this topic, um, the convergence on the right, I don't, I don't think it's fair to call it a conspiracy. Um, I think that's another over, oversimplification that doesn't really allow you to explore the breadth and the depth of what really is uh, simply coalition politics. Um, a conspiracy really does also kind of imply that something illegal is going on here. Um, there may be illegal acts going on, but I think the fact that uh, elements of the anti-environmental lobby are working in coalition and are working in coalition with elements of the broader right, there's no conspiracy here. This is politics. This is what we should be, be doing more of. So I think that, uh, you know, there are conspiracies out there, but what I'm going to be talking about today is not one of them. Um, and, and, and as I've said, I think it's coalition building. Um, I think one of the things I hope to do, I'm, I'm going to be spitting out dozens of, of organizational names and individual names to try to explain how these people all fit together. Um, if it makes sense to anyone here at the end of my remarks, I'm, I haven't been doing my job because it doesn't make sense to me. Um, I can describe these things graphically. I can look on my computer and see where these people operate and how they operate. Uh, but why they're working in these coalitions and what the result is, I think this is what we need to think about. This is our homework. This is what we need to do to address this movement. I, uh, I'm going to turn on the overhead projector and turn off the light, at least that one. This is a... Um, Missing overhead slide, here we go. I'm sorry if people in the back can't make that out. That's, um, <coughs> we have this very fancy screen here, and uh, that's about the best I can do. This is a, a long passage from um, an article that Tarso re referred to last night. In 1979 and 1980, Ron Arnold, the architect of the YG's movement, wrote a series of articles describing why the YG's movement needed to be invented. And he does take credit for inventing this movement um, almost out of whole cloth. Um, Essentially, he describes citizen activist groups needing to ally with other elements of the anti-environmental movement. And, and at that time, the anti-environmental movement chiefly was comprised of trade associations, uh, free market think tanks that have been active in this country for, uh, in some cases, dozens of years. The American Enterprise Institute goes back to the 1950s, I believe. Um, he was talking about, uh, well, you can read the thing here yourself. I mean, essentially, his, his, his theory was, you know, corporate front groups corporations themselves, free market think tanks, legal foundations like the Mountain States Legal Foundation and the Pacific Legal Foundation don't have the same power, the grassroots power and the media power that a citizen's movement has. He recognized early on that that was one of the core, essential, powerful elements of the environmental movement, that we were a populist movement that gained a lot of sympathetic press and was able to mobilize people for the sake of the environment. And it's a very powerful uh, 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 type of activity to engage in, and it had great effect. Um, so this is, this is how Ron essentially outlined his, uh, his, his desire to build this movement. Now, I should give a little bit of background about CLEAR. CLEAR is um, a clearinghouse. Uh, they, I think they came up with the acronym first and made the words fit, because it's clearinghouse. We use the C and the L from clearinghouse, and, uh, and then the rest of the, the, the first letters. So all right, CLEAR has been active for five years in Washington, D.C. as a uh, a watchdog of the anti-environmental movement. When we started, we initially were looking at so-called wise use groups, the grassroots groups in the anti-environmental lobby that, that um, first met 10 years ago in Reno, Nevada, and began the, the, um, the, the so-called wise use movement in 
concert with a lot of these other right-leaning uh, anti-environmental free market groups. Um, when I started, we had a database that included about 2,500, uh, about uh, 250 organizations. Uh, that list was primarily the list of people who were at Ron Arnold's conference. Um, it was published in the back of his um, YG's agenda that he put out shortly after that meeting. Um, through the, the course of uh, not a particularly long period of time, we broadened our database to the point where today it includes about 2,500 organizations that we have identified as working in connection or as a, a very major part of the anti-environmental lobby. Um, now there are a couple of reasons to that and I need to explain. Um, this does not mean that 25 or you know, 2,200 new organizations were formed in this country. Um, certainly there are new organizations that have formed as a result of the, the, um, the you know, uh, growth of the anti-environmental movement in the last 10 years. Uh, a majority, I think, of the, of the uh, increase in our database is uh, attributed to two things. Our looking a little bit harder at who is active in the anti-environmental movement and the formation of coalitions and working groups and partnerships among groups that already existed. Um, one area I think there was real growth in new groups was the, the so-called property rights wise use groups, in the, particularly in the East and in the Southeast. Um, a lot of the, the resource groups that were active were, uh, were active before the, 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 Ron, the Ron Arnold Conference in 88, I'm, I'm willing to bet. If I had a lot of time, I'd actually like to find the, the actual formation date of a lot of the groups that we have to try to answer that question. Um, in addition to the database of 2,500 organizations, we have added databases that allow us to more accurately track the, the activist core of the anti-environmental movement. Uh, and that will be the, the, the topic of a lot of these overheads. The, the database now includes 6,000 individuals who are on the staff of a backlash group or are a board member with fiduciary and management responsibility or in a lot of cases advisory boards. Um, and there are really, uh, the, the, that membership base is, is what I use to try to determine, the, uh, part of what I use to determine what the convergence uh, entails. Uh, board linkages among groups is one thing I'm going to try to talk about. Uh, participation in coalitions or working groups on a particular issue is another area with, where we've been able to track a number of groups from the anti-environmental movement as well as the broader right coming together and working in concert. Um, and also there are uh, issue briefings, uh, policy coordination, events that we see uh, like the YG's Leadership Conference that's ha happening right now. Um, Kind of tracking who shows up at those things, who speaks at them, what they say, is a, is a way that um, those of us that, that monitor this stuff are able to kind of track where the movement is headed, uh, what it looks like, what its, what its structure is, and that type of thing. Um, it, it's my opinion that, that a useful way to look at wise use as a political movement is that wise use is not a freestanding political movement. It is a constituent part of the anti-environmental lobby, broadly speaking, along with conservative legal foundations, free market think tanks, trade associations, corporate PR front groups, uh, like the National Wetlands Coalition or the Foundation for Clean Air Progress, sound science advocacy groups, a fairly new player on the, on the scene that, that uh, claim that environmental laws are based on junk science and that sound science needs to be brought to bear for uh, the, the purpose of policy making. And then there are recreation groups and, and property rights groups. These are the working parts of the anti-environmental lobby, broadly speaking. And there are other, other groups, and I think those are the, the main categories. Similarly, I think what, what, we want, what, what I'd like to get people to think about a little bit is that the anti-environmental lobby is a working part of the broader right that includes anti-labor groups, anti-public education groups, uh, the anti-UN conspiracy is a, is a major player in this, this, uh, this right now, and it includes uh, obvious uh, environmental concerns. Uh, the pro-free market think tanks are, are really the, the heart and soul. I think it's safe to say that one of the underlying principles of the backlash is uh, an anti-regulatory fervor. The free market really should be able to answer all these problems and, and deal with the issues of resource allocation, uh, workers' rights, education, all manner of things. Uh, so I, it's, it's important to keep an eye on what these folks are saying and what they're thinking. Um, the religious right. Uh, more and more is becoming active in environmental issues from, from what we've been able to determine. Uh, and then the anti-choice uh, uh, family values coalitions are also becoming more active on the state and local level. Um, by looking at the, the, the anti-environmental movement that way, I think we, we, we get a better sense of, of uh, really how, how the, the, the aspect of coalition building 
has become important to them. And I think the reason that is so is that it's, again, I think safe to say, my, my judgment of this is that um, the political base of the anti-environmental movement is narrow. Um, it's, there was a, a market growth in the power and the, and the public uh, profile of the wise youth movement, the anti-environmental movement, uh, in the early years after Ron Arnold's initial conference. Um, the political base, I think, uh, being narrow is evidenced by the fact that uh, following the, the, um, the elections in 1994 in the 104th Congress uh, in D.C., and I can't speak to state houses around the West because I don't work out here, but certainly in Congress, the contract on America that was a, a part of the, the, uh, the conservative revolution largely was a failure. Regulatory takings was watered down to the point of not even resembling the initial bill list that, that was included in the contract and eventually uh, was never passed anyhow. Um, some of the other core elements that were anti-regulatory, anti-public uh, health and, and labor and environment um, are still being debated, but the, the, some of the comments that we saw back then coming out of people like Chuck Cushman, Ruth Kaiser with the National Federal Lands Conference and others was that they were truly surprised that uh, simply delivering members of Congress to office did not solve their problem and advance their agenda. They thought there was an automatic kind of uh, you know, process there. Uh, members of con Congress similarly were quoted saying, you know, we, we need, really need a little help here. <laughs> you know, we agree with you in, in principle on these politics, but you've got to help us with votes. You can't, if you can't deliver votes for us, we can't do this work. That, I think, was uh, something that was quite shocking to some of the core act activists and, and organizers in the anti-environmental movement, and particularly the YG's movement. Um, I think it was a real slap in the face that, that showed them directly that um, although they're quite con uh, convinced that they're right and that they're doing the right thing for their communities uh, and for the environment as well, uh, that they, their, narrow, their, their narrow base is a liability. Um, a lot of the organizing that took place among YG groups and other anti-environmental groups was, was a, I think, an effort to broaden the political base of the movement. Um, I think it, it could very well be argued that currently some of the forays into broadening the coalition to, into the religious right, into anti-labor groups, into anti-consumer groups, and these types of organizations is another, uh, by necessity, another effort to try to broaden the political base of the movement. Um, the, the consequences of which I'm not sure um, you know, how soon we're going to feel them. Um, already we're starting to see uh, the crossover, the convergence. Um, clearly it's a concern or we all wouldn't be here. Uh, so I, I think it's kind of fundamental to remember that we're dealing with a movement that's, that views itself as an underdog increasingly, even though they know that they're right in their own minds, um, but they also re realize that doing coalition building and politics on this level is really necessary for the advancement of their agenda. Um, now, I'm going to kind of go through, I mentioned the, the three elements of the convergence that, that I've been exploring, um, board linkages among groups, particip participation in coalitions and working groups, and then um, issue briefings and, and events and so forth that are co-sponsored. Um, now, first I want to ask a question. Um, how many people here are, uh, serve on uh, one board? A lot of people, okay. And so you know the responsibilities of being a board member. Uh, it's a lot of work. How many people serve on two boards? Fewer. Three? Four? Five? I'm starting to lose people. Six? Okay. Um, okay, that's very interesting. Um, the reason I ask that is that looking through the database that I'm going to start to show you, and I, I think I'll put the first uh, overhead up now. This is a, uh, a printout from the database that we have internally on our, on our uh, computer system at work. I hope this is, uh, it's a little bit. Can people make that out okay? I mean, it's, it's more or less there. This is a printout of a group in Washington, D.C. called the, the National Wilderness Institute. It's an organization that is opposed to the reauth uh, a strong environmental reauthorization of the Endangered Species Act. Uh, it's been around since uh, the early 1990s. It's a fairly effective group. Um, they put out uh, pretty good publications, uh, and they are, you know, trouble. When you're talking about endangered species issues, this is a, this is a force to contend with. Our database is set up to show you up in the um, upper left-hand corner the name of the group and where their mailing address is and so forth. And we've got a list of the personnel or fellows with the organization. And over on this column, uh, the board members and advisors that we've been able to identify through uh, websites, uh, press clippings, newsletters, whatever, uh, you know, source of information we can dig up. 
Here's a list of people who run as, as board members of the National Wilderness Institute. Henry Lamb, who's an uh, anti-environmental activist, a wise use activist out of Tennessee with a group called the Environmental Conservation Organization. Becky Norton Dunlop, a former uh, staff member or fellow with the Mountain States Legal Foundation, who's currently the, the chair of the Department of Environmental Quality in Virginia, a, a truly frightening woman. Uh, Don Hodell, I think a lot of people know who Don Hodell is. His new job as the, the uh, chair or the president of the Christian Coalition has gotten him back into the news. Then we see a number of members of Congress. How many people who are on boards have a member of Congress on your board? Nobody? Well, oh, there's a surprise. Uh, we've got Charlie Taylor, Larry Craig, Richard Pombo, Dick Army. We've got Becky's husband, George. They met and fell in love in the Department of Interior back during the Sage Rush Rebellion. Very touching story. <laughs> former Senator Steve Sims is a member of the board. Um, uh, former, uh, uh, yeah, former Senator Steve Sims. The reason I asked how many people here are on six boards is because Steve Sims is on six boards. This is a man who is a real linchpin in this movement. He's very active. Um, it, you know, it's, it's, it's important to keep in mind, and, and a number of these people are, are on uh, numerous boards. Um, and, and that could say two things. Either these, things, these people are truly committed to what they're doing and they're just going to work their butts off to make sure their agenda uh, is, is, is met and achieved, or it could suggest another thing, and maybe both. Um, again, the activist base, the intelligentsia, the, the advocates, the true workers in this movement, um, it's a narrow group of people. Um, we see a lot of the same characters showing up time and time again on these boards. Um, I'm not exactly sure what that means because I don't get the, the chance to sit in on these board meetings. I don't know how they do business. But um, it's interesting to me uh, as a, you know, a watchdog of this movement to see how, how these, um, these types of boards are set up and, and how they link. And I'll show you some other applications of our database that will hopefully make that a little more clear. Um, I'm going to show another group now, also based in Washington. This is the Defenders of Property Rights. Uh, they are a legal think tank that was formed to advance regulatory takings legislation. Um, kind of an interesting aside there. Uh, Roger and Nancy Marzula, um, I think also both went through the Mountain States Legal Foundation. Um, they also were involved in Mises, uh, uh, Edwin Mises' Justice Department during the Reagan administration. They recently formed a private firm that will, um, their business will be to uh, uh, represent takings cases in the courts. At the same time as they're advancing a bill in Congress that would streamline the, the court system and the appeal system so that um, aggrieved parties, developers or private property owners, who are denied a permit to develop their property on the local level, level rather than going through a local board or a, a, a local court system to, uh, to challenge that decision, this bill, if it passes, and it's already passed out of the House of Representatives, would allow the aggrieved party to uh, to take the case directly to, to Federal Circuit Court, I believe. Um, I'm not a lawyer, I don't understand how the judicial system works, but that's essentially it. Um, this is a long, uh, you can't really tell, this, this bar indicates that this list goes well beyond here. Uh, but here's another interesting list of, of folks. Larry Craig again, Richard Pombo again, Edwin Meese is here, Orrin Hatch, Lamar Smith, Steve Sims. I, I thought we'd see him somewhere else. Um, uh, some of these other names I don't really know. Gail Norton, who is the uh, Attorney General in the state of Colorado, also I think an alum of the Mountain States Legal Foundation. William Weaver, Bill Weaver, who's an activist here in Montana with a uh, group formerly called Putting People First, now called Putting, Putting Liberty First. Uh, he's an attorney who actually is the attorney for Defenders of Property Rights. Uh, he has been raising a little bit of, uh, raising some eyebrows recently going around demanding the tax forms for progressive environmental groups in the state of Montana entirely within his rights to do, and not necessarily harassment. Uh, and frankly, one of the few uh, pieces of evidence I've seen that the, the, uh, the Wajis movement and the anti-environmental movement are doing opposition research. It, it's remarkable. I know probably Tarso has stories of standing in, in rooms or being misidentified by, um, by the, the anti-environmental movement, just not being clear about who we are. Um, Robert Bork, James Watt. Okay, who here doesn't know James Watt? I mean, you know. <laughs> Clearly, this is a you know a powerful group of people that are that are uh, helping to direct the agenda of defenders of property rights. Is that the George Miller of Congress? Uh, I you know I was thinking California. I don't think so. I don't think that's him. Uh, but I could I could check on that. Um, all right, another one. This is a group that um, folks in Montana may be familiar with. This is the Political Economy Research Center in Bozeman. Uh, they call themselves a free market environmental group. 
they claim they're pro-environment, but their environmentalism stems from a, a belief in the free market. Um, they are prolific publishers. Uh, they have a great website. If you really want to know how these people think, how they operate, I suggest checking them out on the web or trying to get their information directly. They'll send it to you. Um, and it's, I think, worth getting to know their, um, how they operate and what, what their viewpoint is. Again, here's a list of, uh, of board members. Um, one of the things that we've done also, we have a companion database, and the next overhead is going to show you how we track these folks. Uh, we have a companion database that, that um, shows the other organizations that a, a particular activist in one of these groups is involved with. Um, in this case, I'm going to show you Richard Stroop, or Strout, I believe. I'm not sure how he pronounces his name. Stroop. Again, the, the screen here is not quite fitting, but. Uh, he's on the staff of, uh, of PERC. He also sits on the board of the Cato Institute, a prominent free market think tank. Uh, he's on, on the board of PERC as well. He's on the board of a, uh, the Independent Institute. Or he's on the Liberty Tree Board of Advisors. Liberty Tree is their publishing arm. Uh, he is a member of the National Policy, Policy Forum uh, and also uh, an advisor to the Advancement of Sound Science Coalition, an industry front group run out of a PR agency in Washington <laughs> that has a speakers bureau of over 400 uh, corporate and, uh, and other scientists who speak to the, the junk science behind uh, environmentalism. Um, I mentioned this, this new element in the anti-environmental movement. This is a, a pretty savvy group. I mean, well, they run out of a PR group. Their, their business is to be effective in the, in the political realm. Uh, so this gives you a sense of how, here's somebody who's very deeply involved in the movement as well. His, his wife, I believe they're married, is Jane Shaw. I think I have Jane here as well. And you can see that Jane is also involved with Cato, the Adva Advancement of Sound Science Coalition, and something called the American La Land Foundation. Uh, this was a group that was established in Texas by the far uh, an activist with the Farm Credit Property Rights, uh, the Farm Credit uh, Bank of Texas, to uh, attempt to form a funding mechanism for the wise use movement. Um, and as far as I can tell, the, the huge influx of money they got initially from the Farm Credit Bank of Texas, surprisingly enough, uh, was there the only money that I've ever seen that they've gotten. I, I haven't gotten uh, any further information on that. Uh, but a number of, of very core uh, wise use activists were involved in putting that together, uh, including Jane Shaw. Now Jane and Richard came to my office one time when they were in DC, very upset that I considered them anti-environmental, and I really felt for them. But, uh, you know, despite the, you know, the, the semantic uh, technical differences between uh, regulatory environmentalism uh, that manages resources through a regulatory regime and, and their vision, which is uh, not entirely free market. They do allow for the fact that, you know, well, yeah, if people break laws, they should be punished. But what laws? You know, it's, it's, you, know you could go in circles arguing these points with them. But they came by and said, you know, we, we really don't want to be on your website. We don't think we're anti-environmental. And I said, well, that's just too bad because you're going to be on there because look at what you do. I mean, it's just, you're one of the leading organizations in this movement, and I think it's important for people to know that. Now, uh, the next overhead shows you what this information looks like on our website. And I, I hope this, I don't know how we're going to deal with this. Maybe I'll just move this forward a little bit. That pretty much gets it there. Our website, um, and afterwards people can get the address from me. Um, it's, it's a work in progress. We've got a lot of information on there, but we really are just, again, scratching the surface. A lot of the connections and, and links that we can make have, have yet to be put in place. One thing we do have are two databases that are linked to this data page for a group like, uh, like PERC in Bozeman. On one side here, we've got the members of the staff and the, of the organization, as well as the board members. And you can see that many of them are underlined, indicating that there's a link on that person's name through which you can find out the other organizations that they are involved with. We've done the same thing with their funding sources. We probably have funding information on, on less than 10% of the 2,500 groups that we have. Two reasons for that. They don't have to tell us where they get their money. Um, we just have to sleuth around for it, and it's, it's really hit or miss. And honestly, I think another reason is a lot of these groups just don't really have funding sources. Um, you know, there's 2,500 organizations. It's, it's uh, entirely conceivable that many of them are really low budget. Um, Certainly some of the local groups are run out of you know, somebody's kitchen. Uh, probably you're not officially recognized by the tax, uh, the IRS, uh, for instance, or may not have a board. Um, so 
where we can, however, we do try to collect this information and again, link it to, to reveal uh, the, the further associations of some of these funders. And I'm gonna be, the next two uh, overheads I put up will show you um, a couple of those links. And uh, the, the people that, or the person I did here, you've already seen this, um, was Jane Shaw. This is what we have on Jane Shaw, um, showing that she's on the staff of this organization, but also a board member of these four other organizations, or three other, I should say. Um, uh, this is, you know, I invite people to take advantage of this. Again, I don't know what it means. I just can describe that it's there. Um, this, these, these networks exist, they're being built. Um, all of you who serve on a board know what it means to be a board member. Um, you know how your own board operates and what your responsibilities are. We don't really know how their boards operate. So uh, I think that's, that's information that needs to be collected, but we just haven't gotten that far yet. Um, and then just real quickly, for Amico, we can demonstrate to you. Uh, a number of the other backlash organizations that we've identified that are also funded by Amico, um, including the Advancement of Silent Science Coalition, the Global Climate Coalition, uh, another corporate front group, uh, the Reason Foundation, one of the preeminent uh, libertarian free market think tanks operating currently, um, the Air Quality Standards Coalition, that was a corporate front put together uh, a year and a half ago by the National Association of Manufacturers to challenge the more stringent air quality standards that the EPA were advancing at the time. Um, they had limited success. Fortunately, they didn't win overall. Uh, so, this is the you know this is the type of information that we've been collecting and trying to uh, to put in a digital format. Um, I know it's very difficult. I mean, I, I've got it easy. I, a lot of the groups that I uh, that I monitor are uh, more mainstream political groups. Uh, they do have newsletters. They do get uh, news stories uh, often. They um, a lot of them have web pages now. Uh, Tarso was talking last night about elements of the convergence that I don't frankly have a lot of information on, and many of you probably have much more than I do. How is the militia and the patriot movement involved and, and uh, kind of uh, integrating with the, the environmental backlash and the broader right? I don't have that much information on that. It won't appear on this website. Um, this will be helpful for you know determining other parts of the backlash, but not necessarily the um, the uh, you know the, the the kind of radical wackos. Um, now, two other, two other ways, and this is where we get really high tech. Um, you know, this is about as, as high tech as we get on the website. I uh, began about two years ago uh, scribbling on big pieces of paper these, what some people have called mafia charts or schematics that describe the connections in a graphical way. I don't have a program to do this, so what you're about to see might scare you. Uh, but it's my handwriting, uh, my, my late night ruminations, uh, you know, well past the time when I probably should have gone home saying, well, how does this work? What does this look like? Um, and again, all I, all I can tell you is that I'm describing networks and links that exist. I know that they exist. I don't know exactly what they mean to the overall policy of the, of the anti-environmental movement. Um, the first one I think I'm going to put up is, now I'm, I'm going to put up, the National Federal Lands Conference has been mentioned a couple of times. This was my first map, um, and I, I unveiled this a year ago in Spokane, uh, where I first met Paul and a number of other folks in this room, um, and it didn't make any sense to me, and I, I, was, I was upfront about that. But it was interesting. I'm just going to show you that to show you how absurd these connections can look when you, when you put them down on paper. This is the only one that doesn't go, you know, with the screen. Um, what I did a long time ago was put the National Federal Lands Conference here in the middle of this piece of paper. And I said, all right, who are the main activists that I can identify with the NFLC that are also active with other groups? I identified Mark Pollitt, who formerly worked with Edwin Meese and was one of the co-authors of the Reagan Executive Order on Takings. He's a board member. Um, you see he kind of shows up in a different, couple of different places. Ron Arnold, who was an advisor, um, but claims to have left the organization um, strangely, that, that uh, avowal coincided with, their, with the NFLC publishing a, a newsletter with the headline Danner article, Why There Is a Need for the Militia in America. Um, all of a sudden, Ron Arnold didn't really have anything to do with this group. There's no evidence whatsoever to show that he actually officially resigned on paper. Um, but, you know, I'm not going to sweat that one with, with Ron. He can deny it all he wants. Ruth Kaiser runs the organization. Now, what I did here, I'll go in this direction. Ruth Kaiser is also the Utah State Director of the Alliance for America. 
Um, another state director that she works with through the Alliance for America is a guy by the name of Dr. Michael Kaufman from the state of Maine. He's the state director for the Alliance there. Dr. Michael Kaufman sits on a political organization called the Council for National Policy, which is a super secret uh, policy formation and strategy salon on the hard right that was formed, I don't know how many years ago, a decade or so ago, by Richard Biggery, who was one of the, the chief architects of the resurging new right in this country. Um, and you can see in my, my scribbly writing some of the other members of the Council on National Policy. Phyllis Schlafly, Ed Meese, Don Hodell, Philip Dobson, uh, Richard Biggery, uh, Ralph Reed, Paul Weirich, James Watt, Dick Armey, uh, Jesse Helms, and a number of other, other folks. These are folks whose main interests include working for uh, the Consumer Alert, which is a free market consumer group, uh, the Competitive Enterprise Institute, the Reason Foundation, the Sarah Scaife Foundation, one of the main funding uh, sources for the new right in this country, uh, uh, the, the, the fortune of which comes from uh, Rich, uh, Richard Mellon Scaife, uh, the American Legislative Exchange Council. Many people who work in state politics um, in the state legislature may be familiar with ALEC. It is a clearinghouse of policy papers and model legislation uh, based on a free market uh, a, a agenda that covers a broad range of topics, the environment being but one, that um, has a membership base of, they claim, 3,000 state legislators out of the total elected legislative body on the state level in this country of 7,000, so nearly half. Uh, they give this information away, um, these model pieces of model legislation, uh, to their, their legislator members on the state level. Um, their passage rate in the last session, I believe, was 25%. They had uh, close to a, uh, over 1,000 bills um, introduced in state houses around the, the country and achieved, I think, a 22 to 25% passage rate. They were formed by the Heritage Foundation. That'll give you a sense of what their agenda is. And then on up the line, the National Wilderness Institute, the Mountain States Legal Foundation. Um, so if you like to play what is also known on campuses as the Kevin Bacon game, where you link actor Kevin Bacon to virtually any other actor who's ever appeared on screen by jumping through these various connections, if you, if you, uh, you know, want to engage in that type of intellectual um, activity, if you could be called that, this is, you know, this is linking the little old county movement out in Bountiful, Utah, with the most powerful uh, coordinating body of the new right that, that exists today, and, and certainly the most secretive. Um, in the other direction, Ron Arnold, of course, is um, certainly denies that he's a part of this, this organization anymore, uh, but Arnold used to be. Clearly, he has an association that dates back to some point in the past. He is the executive vice president for the Center for Defense of Free Enterprise. His boss is Alan Gottlieb, who's also, by the way, on the Council on National Policy. Go over that one. Um, two other groups that he runs, Gottlieb runs the Citizens Committee for the Right to Keep and Bear Arms and the Second Amendment Foundation. On the board of Citizens Committee are some guy named Roach, um, Dan Quayle, the, the vice president, and Tom Clancy, the author with the really bad sunglasses, um, <laughs> who also sits on the American Conservative Union another policy formation group on the right that, that directs uh, strategy and policy. He sits there with Ralph Reed, again, CMP, uh, Becky Norton Dunlop with the National Wilderness Institute, and then you just go on and on from there. I mean, you really could just spend an hour going around and around in circles. It'd be like, you know, running laps or something. Um, it's fairly complicated. It's fairly complex. And uh, again, how useful having this type of information <coughs> portrayed this way is, I, you know, it, that's up to you to draw your conclusions. I suggest that we're looking at a not necessarily a roadmap as, as, as much as uh, some kind of a schematic of, of how these folks are, are forming these bonds. Clearly not all of these people are, can be described as simply anti-environmentalists. Clearly many of them are the heart and soul, ooh, I don't like that term, the, the brain trust, no that's not so good either. Anyway, the, you know, the main people in the, in the right. Um, so, you know, this was fun to do, but then I realized, okay, I've got to try to narrow this down a little bit and hopefully I can do that. Um, I still have a little bit of time. Um, actually, I think what I'm going to do is jump to the element of the convergence that is covered by coalitions that exist, uh, a number of which we track on our, um, on our website uh, and on our databases. I'm going to jump back one, one page here, or a couple of pages, to look at... These things really stick together. The defenders of property rights. Now, I'm going to put this way up top here so people in the back can see it. 
Here are a number of click boxes in our database that we have um, clicked to indicate that DPR is a member of this coalition or signed on to this particular letter or whatever the, the, the case may be. Um, they were um, and still are listed as a, an umbrella group under the umbrella initially started by the Environmental Conservation Organization in 1988 and 89 to coordinate the growth of the YG's movement and, and to facilitate communications. <coughs> Currently, the Alliance for America, the second one, uh, does that work. That's a, a coalition that uh, has about 600 uh, local anti-environmental wise use groups as a part of its umbrella. Um, Chuck Cushman has um, started publishing something called the, the um, League of Property Rights Voters Scorecard. It's a scorecard that mirrors the uh, League of Conservation Voters Scorecard, rating members of Congress on their environmental votes. He's put out three of them so far. Um, and uh, Defenders of Property Rights was a sponsor, which meant that they, they actually gave money for the publication of this thing for each and every one of them. DPR is also on the grassroots ESA coalition, another Chuck Cushman vehicle that was put together to advance a, a uh, non-regulatory, voluntary-based reauthorization of the Endangered Species Act. Uh, Get Government Off Our Back is a anti-regulatory, uh, anti-government coalition um, that I have a slide for as well. Uh, the National Center for Public Policy Research is a free market think tank and organization in D.C. that uh, is really currently playing a major coordinating role connecting grassroots wise use groups and the free market world in Washington, D.C. They publish something called the Resource Locator so that activists and media types who are concerned with environmental politics would know who to call to ask about takings, legislation, uh, wilderness, uh, wetlands, all manner of environmental um, uh, issues. Under the events, they weren't at the original, um, or they did not sponsor and did not uh, apparently attend the original 1988 Wise Use Conference, the one that um, Ron Arnold put together in Reno. Um, they were listed in a book called It Takes a Hero by William Perry Pendley of the Mountain States Legal Foundation, which by the way was the best thing he ever did for me. Uh, this is a book that came out just after I started at Clear when we, as I said earlier, had a database of 250 organizations. Um, again, just really getting started. Uh, there was a um, an appendix to that book called The Hero Network that gave out a thousand additional leads. Um, I just scanned that puppy into my database. It took a little bit of work, but next thing I knew, I had a, a, a database of a thousand organizations and individuals that um, our friend William Perry Pendley had identified as being active in the anti-environmental movement. Uh, and there are a number of other things here um, that, that Defenders of Property Rights um, has been identified by, by myself and my staff as um, kind of participating in, uh, with respect to anti-environmental um, action and, and, uh, and coalition building. Um, I'm gonna give a, the, the roughly 20 coalitions and events here. Um, I, I, I wanted to mention a couple of other groups that were in uh, Reno in 1988, just to give a flavor of how this was not strictly an anti-environmental group. There were other right-wing oriented groups that were there including Accuracy in Academia, uh, the American Freedom Coalition, which was the political arm of the of Moon's Unification Church in this country, and had ties to both Ron Arnold and, and Alan Gottlieb. Um, they rapidly deny those things, or attempt to at least um, avoid that issue. The California Chamber of Commerce uh, was also in Reno. The California Farm Bureau was there, the Competitive Enterprise Institute, a free market think tank. Consumer Alert, uh, the so-called free market uh, consumer uh, organization and the Mountain States Legal Foundation. They were all there. Um, again, they have uh, elements to their agenda that include anti-environmentalism, but they're not strictly anti-environmental. This is another area where the convergence happens. These are broad agendas that are being dealt with here. Um, all right, first, I'll let you look at Get Government Off Our Back. Uh, this is a, rare, a relatively new uh, operation uh, based in DC and just looking down the list you'll see that there are some recognizable anti-environmental groups but clearly some recognizable uh, broader right organizations that are that are uh, included here. US term limits down here, the US Chamber of Commerce, um, Institute for Justice, uh, I don't know really what the Council for Government Reform is but um, it doesn't really strike me as an environmental group off the, off the top there. The American Rental Association Americans for tax reform. Tax reform is another um, real, you know, key constituency in this backlash, I think. And again, consumer alert. Uh, in the NCPPR, the National Center for Public Policy Research locator, 
they listed a number of uh, prominent activist groups that had information for media and activists to, to gain uh, insight into policy and so forth. Um, this, again, included a number of groups that have a broader right-wing wing, uh, agenda. Um, where are they? The American Council on Science and Health, uh, that's kind of anti-environmental. Uh, the Cato Institute, CDFE, uh, Committee for Constructive Tomorrow, C Competitive Enterprise Institute, uh, Consumer Alert again, uh, the George C. Marshall Institute, the National Center, uh, well obviously they, they're there, they put it together, uh, and the U.S. Chamber of Commerce. The point I'm trying to make here is that these coalitions, these, these, uh, these efforts to, to build coalitions are, um, at least uh, recently from what we've been discovering, more broad than simply anti-environmental. Uh, again, the point is they're building coalitions for the sake of, of broadening their political base and also broadening the, the information that they have at their disposal. Uh, one last one, I think. I don't know if I brought this. Nah, I didn't bring the other one. I'm going to skip it because we're starting to run short on time. Um, <coughs> events and issue briefings, another area that we can look at to discover how the convergence is coming together, uh, how these fellow travelers are working in concert with one another to advance the agenda. Um, I've mentioned it a couple of times, Tarso said it last night, Ron Arnold and his gang are meeting uh, this weekend, 10th anniversary of his leadership conference. Um, and there's an interesting cast and crew that shows up there. Um, I, I was there last year. Some of the people that were there last year haven't shown up again this year. There are a bunch of repeat folks. Um, this is from uh, somebody's web page, the American Land Rights Association web page. Uh, has a list of the, the participants, the speakers that are going to be um, speaking today down in, uh, in Sparks. Uh, Congressman Helen Chenoweth, of course, will be there. Um, Wayne Hage will be there. Uh, Jack Cushman is invited. The, the, he's the, uh, the environmental uh, reporter for the, the uh, New York Times. Uh, I'm really interested to find out if he goes to that thing. Um, this is you know, a list of, of the, the various uh, luminaries who will be speaking there. Um, I wanted to give you one more list. Here are some of the other affiliations of, of that list of speakers. Um, Helen Chenoweth is on the board of the Washington Legal Foundation. Uh, John Doolittle is a member of the Council on National Policy, the super secret policy salon on the right. I just like saying super secret policy salon. Um, he's also on the board of Defenders of Property Rights. Uh, R.J. Smith with Competitive Enterprise Institute and the American Land Foundation, Mark Pollitt, Steward to the Range, Pacific Research Institute, National Federal Lands Conference, American Land Foundation. Um, David Ridenauer, or Ridenauer, is uh, somebody that I met and actually had kind of a, a handful of pleasant conversations with last year. Um, he works in D.C. for the National Center for Public Policy Research, uh, has been a, a right-wing political activist for some time from what I've learned, and I haven't got his whole story down yet. Uh, but he also runs something in D.C. Uh, called the uh, Environmental Task Force. And I wanted to pr prevent a, uh, present a little bit of information on that as well. Um, the task force and uh, another uh, element of NCPPR meet on a regular basis in Washington, D.C. I think it's every Wednesday they have a luncheon. Um, and they talk about environmental issues and free market issues and so forth. Uh, and I'm just going to read from some materials that I, I got off of their website. Um, this is from a publication that, uh, that Ridenauer puts out called Scoop, Your Inside View to the Strategies and Activities of the Conservative Movement in Washington. Um, on February 20th of this year, Senator Jim Inhofe from uh, Oklahoma showed up to review his 1998 conservative agenda. His proposals included maintaining budget agreement spending caps, legislating no new entitlements, increasing the per-child income tax exemption, uh, overriding the partial birth abortion ban veto, IRS reform, sunsetting the current tax code, expanding the 15% tax bracket, ending the marriage, marriage penalty, school choice, uh, perm permitting parents to uh, save money on their education for tax-free uh, allowances or something, uh, opposing the Kyoto Global Warming Treaty, uh, opposing the EPA air quality mandates from last year. You see there's quite a, quite a broad range of, of issues that the senator was covering. Um, on January 23rd of this year, Tom Jipping of the Free Congress Foundation uh, was, was talking about their effort to um, 
hold up judicial nominations. There's a, currently a backlog of some 80 judicial nominees that, that, uh, or slots in the, in, the, in the judicial system that have not been filled. Um, this is not an accident. This is very clearly a, uh, you know, on the political agenda of the Free Congress Foundation. Um, on December 19th, uh, a handful of folks got together. This I just highlighted because I think it's cute. Uh, it says, to mark the final meeting of the year, task force participants nominated and voted on their favorite ridiculous quotes by extreme environmentalists in 1997. Um, the following are the top 10 selections, which were submitted by Myron Ebel of Frontiers of Freedom, currently was the Washington representative for Chuck Cushman, uh, formerly was the, the Washington representative for Chuck Cushman, Brian C. Scholes and R.J. Smith of the Competitive Enterprise Institute, Rich Zipperer, Zipperer of, the, of Consumer Alert, blah, blah, blah. Um, they're just getting for, together for a little conservative fun. Um, in November, uh, on November 5, Catherine Kless of uh, Jim Talent's office showed up to talk about uh, 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 helping low, uh, empower low-income parents scholarships act or something like that. Uh, Pat Riley of the Capital Resource Center, a conservative research group that tracks the giving patterns of, of progressive philanthropies, um, distributed his analysis on activities, especially corporate donors to the National Organization for Women. Now this is all folded in with, uh, generally with anti-environmental discussions. So again, through this working group and this coalition, we see how anti-environmental issues are advanced at the same time as other issues within the broad uh, kind of reactionary political right. Um, and the one last coalition I think I have here, um, and this does not have an overhead either. I'm sure you'll all be glad to hear. Uh, Consumer Alert in uh, April 17, on April 17th of 1996, issued something called, it was just in time for Earth Day. It's the proclamation in support of, new in, of a new environmental vision to protect our families, our future, and our freedom. Uh, the principles were, and there are seven of them, economic growth is a vital prerequisite for environmental progress. The federal government should establish an environmental Hippocratic oath First, do no harm. Number three, land and natural resources are best managed by private standards. Number four, state and local environmental problems should be dealt with at the state and local level. Uh, number five, federal efforts should focus on results, not regulations. Six, no regulation without representation. And seven, property owners should be compensated for regulatory <coughs> takings. Um, now, I think it's a little strange. Consumer alert, you would think, well, this is not a group that would, you know, you would assume would be involved with environmental issues. Well, as it turns out, actually, the authors of these proclamations were activists with the Competitive Enterprise Institute and the Cato Institute, uh, both free market groups that have been uh, strongly tied with the anti-environmental movement. The signatories of that set of proclamations and principles, again, shows a little bit of the breadth of this movement. Uh, Grover Norquist with Americans for Tax Reform. Um, Allison Tucker with the Center for the Study of Popular Culture. Uh, the Committee for Constructive Tomorrow, Competitive Enterprise Institute, the uh, Independence Institute, uh, Political Economy Research Center, Small Business Survival Committee, and Young Americans for Freedom, the uh, organization that's been active on college campuses, um, the place where Alan Gottlieb uh, kind of cut his political teeth back in the 70s before he formed CDFE. Um, those are just uh, those are the, the examples I, that I, I wanted to bring out that just kind of, again, confuse the hell out of everybody and overwhelm you. I hope I've achieved that. Um, looking around the room, I see some people are going, what is he talking about? And again, I don't know. Um, I, I wanted to show a couple of other things, just, just for fun. Um, this is, uh, there, there's something that's actually quite serious, and, and folks may have noticed Dr. Michael Kaufman, who I referred to earlier. Um, he was on a speaking tour in Montana. Currently, he's, uh, he's cruising through Virginia. Kaufman is out of Maine. He is the, the lead um, advocate of, well, really two anti-environmental theories that are quite dangerous in their application. The first that he, he wrote a book on and sold many copies of was the thesis that environmentalists are um, uh, really part of a green pagan cult that's anti-Christian and bent on destroying uh, monotheistic religion. Um, people who need an enemy and need to vilify their enemy really took this up quite quickly. And, and it, it was widely spread and widely believed Currently, his, his main uh, organizing tool is the, um, the anti-UN treaty, uh, or the anti-UN conspiracy that uh, international 
environmental agreements, uh, world heritage areas. This is all part of a, uh, you know, a, a massive agenda to take over private property and, and public land in this country. And it's part of a, a UN uh, attempt to gain kind of one world government. Uh, this is similarly dangerous because when you hear him speak, and I've gotten some, some great intelligence from folks um, who I, I was hoping would be here this weekend, he essentially, well, he doesn't essentially, he comes right and calls, envi comes right and calls environmentalists Nazis. He uses the term Nazi several times. Um, he alleges that the, the end result of much of the, the uh, UN agenda on the environment is um, reduction in global population, um, which is a polite way of saying genocide. So essentially what he is saying um, by, you know, by extension is that environmentalists of all type are Nazis who want to engage in genocide. This is very, very dangerous for folks who don't know any better to hear because, um, again, if you want to vilify your enemy, in this case, us, environmentalists, progressives, um, you know, scare the pants off them. And it was, it's very effective. I've, I've seen his tape and he's, he's, um, his arguments are full of holes, but if you don't really sit down and look at them, it's easy to, to fall for it. Um, I'm going to show a couple more charts. Uh, I don't know. Uh, one's called one's called environmentalism. Yeah. One's called um, I'm telling you this high technology stuff is so hard. Uh, the book that he did on, on the the green religion thing was called Environmentalist. Uh, the what did he call it? The Dawn of Aquarius or a the New Dark Age. You know, and it's this whole you know environmentalists are bringing on a dark age. Or, you know, a you know a real you know that's terrible. I mean, I mean, I had to read part of it, but I couldn't read the whole thing. Um, here's Michael Kaufman up here. Michael Kaufman is on the, this, the Council on National Policy. He's affiliated with the Alliance for America. And interestingly, another right-wing uh, convergence that we can talk about, while he's on tour, he is, he's actually speaking around the country and has been for a year and a half as a member of the John Birch Society Speakers Bureau. Um, and in fact, the, the evidence that I collected from his swing through Montana was that he openly suggested people join John Birch. Now, a lot of people in here, I think, are very familiar with the John Birch Society and their views on uh, public policy and, and, and governance and, and, uh, and global, uh, you know, global issues as well. Uh, I thought it was very interesting that he was quite openly advocating the, the support of the John Birch Society. In fact, uh, the folks in, um, I can't remember where it was that, that gave me this information, said that uh, less than a week later, the John Birch Society used his sign-up list to send out invitations for a recruiting meeting, um, inviting people to come back for a second meeting to learn how to join the John Birch Society. Uh, we're working on a report right now um, that I hope to release in time for the, the announcement of the American Heritage Rivers um, designees that, that, were, um, that have been put together over the last year and a half as a result of uh, President Clinton's announcement in his 97 State of the Union address. Um, Kaufman is really playing a major role in, in trying to kill that. Um, Kaufman is uh, one of the founders of a group called Sovereignty International. Its main concern is exposing this global conspiracy. Henry Lamb is another of the founders. Henry is with ECO with all of these folks. Steve Sims, Nancy Marzula, Fred Singer. Uh, this is a little bit more manageable, but again, it shows you how from one organization you really can get a, um, a, a view of, of the, the constituent parts, the working parts of um, a, a certain slice of this backlash. Um, and this is where we, we get a little bit silly. I hope. I hope people aren't insulted by this. Um, I did one thing to, uh, to take a look at, uh, I don't know who asked me to do this, but I'm just going to give you the bottom part. This is Representative Charlie Taylor from North Carolina, I think, uh, who's on the advisory board of the National Wilderness Institute and the Washington Legal Foundation, along with this list of folks. Kenneth Starr, among them. Uh, <laughs> Kenneth Starr is you know, getting kind of well known here. Roger Marzulla, Gail Darden, Larry Craig, Larry Craig, Larry Craig, Larry Craig, Larry Craig, uh, Richard Pombo, he's probably on both lists. Um, I put that together for, for, uh, for somebody who needed to know, you know, what is, what is Charlie Taylor's role in this whole thing? And that's kind of how I describe it. Again, trying to narrow this, this a little bit more. And uh, this... I know everybody's going to really appreciate it. Monica Lewinsky. Okay. <laughs> this is where we get into really absurd stuff. Monica Lewinsky is not part of any conspiracy. However, she was taped by Linda Tripp, who is represented by James Moody, who is a libertarian legal activist uh, who volunteers for the Landmark Legal Foundation. The board of Landmark includes Edwin Meese, 
and William Bradford Reynolds, both of whom serve on a number of um, right-wing groups and, and anti-environmental groups. The Council on National Policy, Defenders of Property Rights. But importantly, I think that this side of the screen that I'll pull over now, um, and this is something we can't even really begin to talk about, um, the Landmark Legal Foundation is funded by a fellow um, th that I mentioned earlier, um, uh, Richard Mellon Scape. His, his foundations fund a number of other organizations that I think are very important to, to know. Um, and, and we've seen many of these already in my remarks. Um, the Heartland Institute, the, you know, a bunch of legal foundations. Um, is there a conspiracy? No, I'm not going to use the term conspiracy. I think there, there was a headline that I saw that said, no, it's not as much a conspiracy as it is an industry. So maybe that's a more constructive way to look at this. Richard Mellonscape is investing money in the right, uh, which is investing uh, content and ideas and policy in the anti-labor movement, the anti-environmental movement, the anti-education movement, all the way down. Um, again, if you follow these links up and forth, up and, and, and back, you know, back and forth all over the place like I do, and I certainly hope you won't try it, um, you, can, you can learn a lot about what this movement looks like. Um, we can develop to, you know, start to develop some of these little schematics um, and hopefully gain an understanding of what, again, is not a convergence as much as it is a, a, a building coalition, a, a developing coalition. Now, I didn't get to touch on a lot of the issues that I hope will take place or will be discussed in the breakout groups. What does this mean to you all in your work? Um, what does it mean to environmental organizers to have the Christian coalition start showing up as a, as a constituent part of some of these coalitions, like the Grassroots ESA coalition? <laughs> what does it mean for uh, you know, uh, pa Christian patriot groups and, and the militia to be involved in uh, local zoning, zoning uh, debates and that type of thing? Uh, you need to start talking about these. You really need to address this type of stuff. Um, I've showed kind of the meta-analysis, the, the, you know, the huge um, you know, macro view or uh, you know, broad umbrella of how this, this movement is, is constructed. And really the, the, the most useful work and understanding we can gain of it is at the local level. Um, I don't have the benefit of working on the local level. I apologize that I can't provide more of that type of information. I hope that beginning here, folks in this room will start to develop that type of information for your own benefit for the benefit of your partners in the progressive community and for the benefit of the community. Because um, you know, I think that's really what we're all concerned about. Um, checking his notes, he says to himself, self, that's about it. That's all I have to say. I know I've gone a full hour, and I don't know if we have time for any uh, questions. For the sake of trying to get us back on schedule, let's, let's take a few questions. I don't think it would be right to have a panel without questions. But let's limit it to 10 minutes, and then I'll explain okay. the breakout Someone's and what to expect for lunch and all of that as soon as the questions are done. In the back. I have two questions. Uh, what are your website? Uh, how do you get into your website? Okay. And the other one is, do you have a newsletter or anything like that that you could have it be accessible? Did I plant that question? <laughs> <laughs> thank you for no, thank you for asking that. Yeah. The website address, the main address for the environmental working group, which is where my project is housed, is www dot ewg dot org my actual home page is much longer and i honestly can't remember what it is but i have a i have cards i can give out to people i can get you that there are a number of links that you need to take to follow in there we do put out a newsletter is it up there no we do put out a newsletter it goes out every other week it's called a clear view um, it's about three thousand to four thousand words and it reports on kind of the comings and goings of the broad anti-environmental movement um, it's free. It's it's sent out primarily by um, by email because it's cheap to do it that way. We couldn't afford to fax it any longer. Um, each and every one of our past issues is archived on our website. We're working on making that a searchable database. We're working on creating links between the data page that I showed you from my website and the stories that we've written um, uh, about people like um, Jane Shaw or her organization, PERC. Um, that is coming. Uh, hopefully this year we'll really develop um, a much more efficient system, much better links. Yes? Do you have copies of your handwritten charts? Oh, I don't know. Yeah, I can make copies. I don't have initial copies here. Um, yeah, sure, that'd be fine. I, I, Paul, is there a, there's got to be a photocopy or somewhere here. So. Yes? Can you tell us a little bit more about the child science groups? They seem to be new on the stage. Well, they're not entirely new. It's just that they've seen, they seem to be taking on more prominence. Um, one of the initial junk scientists, um, or one of the initial elements of the junk science advocacy was uh, the kind of anti-global warming advocacy that has been uh, taking place for some time. 
a fellow by the name of Dr. Patrick Michaels, who writes something called the World Climate Review, has been around for years and years um, as a, a, an ozone depletion skeptic or a global climate change skeptic, um, along with a guy by the name of Fred Singer with the Science and Environmental Policy Project. What is new uh, are efforts by uh, corporations through public relations firms to develop much broader and much more activist and much more uh, kind of aggressive outreach on, uh, on sound science issues. And the two most prominent that come to mind there are um, the uh, Advancement of Sound Science Coalition, uh, run out of APCO Associates, which is a, I think their parent organization is, a, is a, an advertising firm, and another called uh, the Foundation for Clean Air Progress that also uh, talks about science issues and, and public policy. That's run by Burson Marsteller and is funded by the transportation industry and the agriculture industry. Their main message is, our air has gotten a lot cleaner in the last 25 years. Look at how much cleaner it is. So do we really need these you know, onerous new regulations that are being proposed? Um, in the back? Yeah, I'm just wondering, in terms of the linkages that you're talking about within the, this right independent or whatever you call it, um, do you think that if they did the same analysis on the environmental movement, they would find the exact same thing? It just seems to me that oh, sure. I, I mean, so what is, so I guess I'm just wondering what, how that's any different than what we're doing. And I mean, we don't have Congress people on our boards. But, <laughs> right. Um, <laughs> and we don't serve on as many boards, perhaps. Well, but but advisory boards, I would say, yes, a lot of the key people do. When you look at advisory yeah. boards, I mean, you see the same thing over and over and over and over and over again. And, um, and I'd like to throw out one other question, which is do you have any of those um, environmental, anti-environment boards? Those quotes, those 10 quotes from that little yeah. bunch No, I don't. But I, if, if you're interested, I could, get, I could get that off the website. This was cut and pasted in fax by, uh, to me by my research assistant, and she didn't get all of the stuff on there, just a couple of uh, tidbits. Um, I, I'm actually kind of curious about that, too. Um, um, I think, the, I think this, putting these charts together is a useful exercise um, as a demonstration that, that there is a, a set of organizations on the right that are working together. Um, I think that we could probably prove that that's happening on our side as well. The, the thing that I hope to achieve by doing this type of, of demonstration is to just inform people in the progressive community that that is politically, a political reality. Um, too often, I think, environmentalists become um, focused on a single issue and a single campaign. And I think, ideally, what we need to do is understand that we are fighting it an integrated and cooperative and, and politically sophisticated, or at least complicated, um, set of foes that are working and uh, providing assistance to one another to defeat our agenda. Um, and I guess the, the lesson by extension is we need to do the same thing. Uh, I, I had a, there was a story in the, in the paper this morning that um, was a result of an interview I did. And I was mischaracterized there as, it, it made it look like I said that the anti-environmental movement invented coalition building. Well, nothing could be further from the truth. Ron Arnold, uh, I think very accurately, uh, saw how the environmental movement had developed coalitions and had built local power that way. And I think that's why he put the, the wise use movement together the way that he did. Um, it's not that we have forgotten how to do coalition building. I think it's just that we need to do a little bit more of it. I think exactly, I, I think your point is, is well taken. If they looked at our movement, and they haven't, I don't know why, but if they did, I think they could, they could put these same mafia charts together and show that there's a, you know, allege at least that there's a conspiracy or, or a set of coalitions. I hope that that's true. I mean, I hope we have as many linkages and coalitions as they do, and I, and I can't say whether we do or don't. Um, Can I ask one other question, which is, what is the, you showed one chart of Amico and who Amico funds, and I'm just wondering how much research you guys have done on the connection between um, multinational corporations and this movement and, and where it's going. That seems to be fairly significant. I, I think it is, I agree. Other than the funding of the backlash groups, um, we haven't done anything further than that. No further analysis, no further connections. I am toying with the idea of spending 1500 bucks for a, um, a CD-ROM that has the, the boards of directors of thousands of organizations and corporations. It's like a 60,000 person database. Um, it would be real fun to play with that, and I think there could be useful analysis through looking at corporate board members and how they, uh, where they sit um, on, on a lot of the boards of these free market think tanks, uh, conservative legal <laughs> foundations. We know that they're there. Uh, we just haven't gone really down that road yet. That's an enormous amount of research. Um, and hopefully someday we can get to it. You have a question? Um, we have a local station here called MCAT. <coughs> and they're in the process, the board, 
which also has a Cushman on it, <laughs> is in the process of hiring Randy, who actually started MCAT. And MCAT's done a really good job, and I just wondered if anyone that was happy with MCAT would sign this. They're, they're pushing this through within a month with no clear-cut reason to fire him. And this is really the only form that we have for people that have grievances. because they have a lot of pesticide information. It may be considered a boring station. I really don't watch it, but I know it's there, and I'm happy that it's there, and I'm happy that people can use access to that station. And to fire Randy with no reason within a month, really quickly, without notifying the public is um, unconscionable to me. You know, I think people, the public should be aware of it. And by the way, I was born in Modesto. Okay. I, I, I really have no comment about the, the local station or Randy, whoever Randy is, but I'm sure people are interested in this. I mean, if you want to circulate the petition, I'm sure that'd be fine. Oh, thank you. Um, one more question. One more. Would you name some resources we could look at at the local level to do these kinds of mafia charts? For example, the local development corporation had connected to political appointee committees, things like that? Well, um, one of the best places to do this research is through the, the local newspaper, um, doing text searches, if you can do it in the library, to, to see when some of these people are mentioned. A lot of times information will be provided there that will show that they're representing a particular group or they're speaking at a, uh, you know, at a, at a meeting with a, a set of people or a, you know, that, uh, a meeting that's sponsored by another group. Um, read the papers. Uh, start developing opposition research files. It doesn't take much. I was, I've never been trained in opposition research. I made all of this up as I went along. Um, but what you really need to do is just develop a keen eye for keeping an eye, you know, keeping an eye out for names, um, events, organizations that are part of what you would broadly classify as your, your adversaries or your opponents. Um, and slowly the picture comes into focus. Um, our website can be um, helpful on a limited basis. I think locally we, we don't have as much information as I'd like to have. Um, I would suggest uh, talking with with your um, you know your 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 partners in in other elements of the progressive community, maybe other people have done this work. Um, you'd be surprised if you start talking about person X or organization Y, how much somebody might know about them, the history, their board, where they came from, uh, their objectives. Just start talking about it. I mean, one of the things I hope to achieve in the next five years that I'm at Clear, if I can hang on that long, is to stop doing archaeological opposition research, picking up the pieces as they've fallen, and start working with local groups and state groups to start doing proactive opposition research. Start learning the opposition, learning how they think, and when you put your work plan together, anticipate what they may do, what they might say, how they're going to oppose you. I think that's what we can use this information to help us achieve. Um, you know, really preparing ourselves to, uh, to fight better in these battles. And I see Paul's looking at his watch. Um, I'm here the rest of the day if anybody has any other questions. Thank you for your, for your patience. I know it probably wasn't easy, but I appreciate it. Changes are a fallacy. We don't, need to, we don't need to be for any of those things. This is all the hogwash of the book. He's a tough guy, uh, Dan Barry. He comes to us out of some of the good organizing work. And I'm, I'm feeling here for my for my extemporaneous marks, remarks. Uh, the clearinghouse of environmental and of, of advocacy and research, but comes from a grassroots effort, a rich experience in Congress. He's been on the front line. He's been with uh, Bernie Sanders there, one of the great uh, progressive advocates that we see standing out time and time again in the evening news. But he is in the position of coordinating the great effort to nurture people and to give them direction <coughs> as we face uh, the realities of the wise use movement and the tremendous toll it's taking of people and the process. So Dan, if you will uh, come forward uh, and do your great thing, and if I can keep from picking up your notes, which would be <laughs> yeah, a <little> bit <laughs> it's really a pleasure to have you here. Thank you very much.